So I think we'll go ahead and get started today. My name is Bonnie Treichel, and I'm a senior consultant here at Multnomah Group and the chair of the Technical Services Committee. So I have the pleasure of walking you through um, a webinar that we do each year, which is our um, annual regulatory update. Um, I know it's called the regulatory update, but one of the things that we'll get to do today is talk a little bit more, not just about regulation, but also we'll talk about litigation and some of the um, legislation that's been taking place over the past um, 12 months or so. Um, so a couple of just kind of housekeeping matters, and then we'll really just jump into things. Um, first and foremost, if you have any technical difficulty, you notice that uh, I've fallen asleep at the wheel and forgot to advance the slides or anything, please make sure that you use your question and answer pane to let um, Lindsay, our marketing coordinator, know so that she can uh, take note of that and get me to advance those slides. Or likewise, if you're having any trouble with any of the audio, please let her know that as well. Um, also, I'd like to let you know that there will be a handout. Um, we do a full length regulatory update each year, and that will go into a lot of the things that I'm talking about today in a lot more detail. So a lot of the more technical aspects of some of the topics that we'll discuss today, that's all covered in detail in the full length regulatory update. Um, it will be available after today's presentation. So there'll be an email that goes out to everyone who attends and it will have the recording as well as the full length regulatory update. So one of the things that I'll kind of do as we go through today is make note of some of the things and maybe some page references to where you can find that in the full length regulatory update. Um, questions are certainly encouraged throughout the presentation or if you think of things after the fact, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, again, you can use that question and answer pane and we'll try to have some time at the end for that if you think of anything. Uh, so with that, I think we'll go ahead and jump in. Uh, one of the things that you know we're going to do today is, as I mentioned, this is not going to really dig into a lot of the real technical detail in terms of the regulations or the congressional activity and all of the nitty gritty of what it says. What we're going to do instead is focus on more some of the action items that you should be taking today as it relates to what's been happening in the past 12 months and what might be coming in the next couple of months as we end out the year. So we really want to take more of an action-oriented approach during today's webinar. So, you know, what does that mean? I think we'll break it up into really four sections. So I'll start by giving you really a broad overview of the landscape and the climate in three areas, litigation, legislation, and regulation. Then we're going to take that and, and really look at what is your responsibility as it relates to retirement plans. So thinking big picture, what are your kind of three big areas of responsibility and tasks related to the retirement plan? And then we're gonna piece those first two things together. So we'll look at how the changes um, that have already actually taken place, how those will map over to your fiduciary responsibilities to the plan. And finally, uh, we'll really just end with action items that you can take today and, and start you know, really taking action. So again, as the title suggests, we're gonna focus on more action-oriented steps for your plan rather than the real technical details. So if you're here for the really, really technical things, this might be the wrong webinar. We do some other webinars at Moulton Hill Group that get into some of those more technical aspects. I encourage you to take a look at uh, the newly launched website for some of those. Um, we also have some pretty technical white papers, and I'll maybe make reference to some of those throughout the presentation. Uh, but I probably haven't had enough coffee this morning to really get into all those technical details. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and, and kind of move ahead to what is just the general landscape. Um, one of the things, if you've joined some of our presentations before, read some of our blog posts, you're probably used to this theme that started under this administration or presidential um, administration, which continues to be this theme of a pullback on regulation. So we're seeing that it, it's not just specific to financial services or how we're dealing with retirement plans. Some of you on the line who might have an HR function, you've probably seen this in other areas of, of your job function, right? So less regulation, we're seeing that specific to retirement plans, 
Um, when we look at budgeting, so budgeting for the Department of Labor, for example, uh, some of the staffing cuts, perhaps, um, you know, the Internal Revenue Service, the Department of Labor, um, we see some staffing pullback there. And then, of course, just the actual rollback of regulation itself, the biggest one that comes to mind, which uh, we've done a lot of work with talking to clients about, and we'll talk briefly on this webinar about it as well, but the elimination of the Department of Labor's fiduciary rule. That was a big rollout under the prior administration, which has been, um, you know, it was entirely dismantled and then eventually vacated in the Fifth Circuit. So big theme there, pull back on regulation. Um, at the same time, what's taking the place of that pullback of regulation? I think we're seeing a couple of things. We continue to see an increase in litigation. We also see, uh, particularly this year, I think we've seen, seen an increase in legislative activity. Um, and, and there's always a lot of legislative activity, but as it applies to things which have an impact on your retirement plan, I think it's fair to say that we've got more to talk about this year. So what's the real focus of that legislative activity? Um, you know, a few things I would point out, some of which we'll really cover today because I think they have an impact on you and your plan, and some of which I'll mention here briefly at the outset, but we won't really focus on them because I don't think they have a lot of applicability to those on the call. Uh, the first of which is both at a state level and then in Congress, we see a focus on something called the coverage gap. When I use the term coverage gap, we're not referring to those who have a plan but aren't saving enough. That's not what we're talking about. So we're not talking about like auto enroll or auto escalates, get people to save more. That's not the issue. The coverage gap is talking about those who entirely are lacking access to those workplace retirement plans. So the gap being they don't have access to a plan at all, therefore they're not saving for retirement at all. So we've seen states, um, for example, those on the phone who um, might be an Oregon-based plan um, or resident, you've seen um, Oregon Saves really lead the way in having a state-run plan. And then you've seen several other states who followed behind as well. So states are focused on that. You've also seen Congress start to turn its focus with some of these proposals floating around. Um, again, we're not gonna go through an exhaustive list of the proposals in Congress right now, because there's a lot of them, a lot of different variations. Um, but there is, in that handout I mentioned, the full regulatory update, it does go through kind of a tick list of some of those various proposals. So both states and Congress have been focused on the coverage gap. Um, in addition, you see the president actually weighed in um, and, and turned his attention to the coverage gap. So we saw, um, it's you know, been a few weeks, maybe even a month now, that we saw um, an executive order. I believe actually it was right at the end of August. We saw the president um, had an executive order that focused on a few different things, one of which was really the coverage gap through um, MEPS. So the idea was promotion of MEPS where uh, really, that's going to help mostly in the small market space. So small businesses, small employers can band together and really have one big plan. Um, it's, it's a way to really get more access to workplace retirement plans. At the same time, the president, through that executive order, focused on some other things like administrative efficiencies. Um, think electronic disclosures there. So, And we'll come back to that perhaps a little bit later um, but you saw the president really starting to get involved and turn his attention to retirement as well. Two other things I briefly want to mention before we move on here. Um, Congress uh, took, took their attention and focused on tax reform. That was a big push right at the end of uh, last year, beginning of 2018. And we'll definitely discuss that later, but through tax reform, there were impacts on retirement plans. And those really impact some of the day-to-day -day work that you're doing with your plan, and then also with your plan and with your vendors. Um, the, the last thing I want to mention here is that you know, Congress is really focusing on um, what I would consider to be kind of an overhaul of the retirement plan system. And I think some would argue that you see this happen from time to time, right? So we saw in um, you know, the Pension Protection Act, which has been you know, over a decade ago now, um, that was a big kind of 
retirement plan reform, right? So a lot of changes came from that. Um, and it seems like some would say, um, and maybe rightfully so, that we're, we're due again. There's some things that need to be changed. And so that's why we've had some various ideas floated and, and that are out there. Maybe they'll get finished this year. Um, maybe they won't. But so there's some ideas floating that really seek to have a lot of things change as it relates to retirement plans. I'm not going to spend time today going through all those various proposals because they're just proposals at this point. Um, and so I don't find that to be a good use of our time. But keep in mind that um, as we close out 2018, Congress is still seeking to potentially take some action there, which could um, have something more for us to talk about in early 2019. So that really sets the stage of what's been the landscape for this year and what's potentially going to happen as we close out 2018. So what you really came for is, how does any of this apply to you and your plan? Um, when we think about you and your responsibilities um, as a fiduciary to a retirement plan, there's different ways you can kind of slice and dice what your responsibilities are. And this is certainly not an exhaustive list of your responsibilities, but I think it's easy if you break it down into three main categories. So the first of which is, and what comes to mind most of all for retirement plan committees, I think, is investment monitoring. To have a responsibility to monitor you know, the investments, you, you only select them, you monitor them, and you replace them over time as necessary. Um, you know, a few things that typically includes would be coming up with your investment policy statement, you select your DIAs or designated investment alternatives over time, and then most of you have a QDIA, so that default investment option. The second broad category that I would call it would be fiduciary governance. Um, and not that, quote, fiduciary governance is a specific responsibility, but I think well-run plans have a good structure of fiduciary governance. So what does that mean? Uh, that means documentation of the roles and responsibilities. So perhaps you have a charter, um, that means having your meetings documented, like with your meeting minutes. And then anything else that shows the prudent process. So maybe it's your investment monitoring reports, um, documentation that you've done, fee benchmarking of a vendor, anything that shows that you're following a prudent process. Um, I, another part of what I believe to be good governance is things like today, going through and making sure that you're understanding any rule changes, any regulation changes, because that's going to impact all the other areas where you have fiduciary responsibility to your plan. And the third broad category um, that really you have responsibility to your retirement plan is what I consider you know, vendor and plan management. So uh, this is your selection and monitoring of your service providers. So think your investment consultants, think your uh, record keeper, that sort of thing. Um, and then obviously the day-to-day -day operations. So for some, you might consider this to be the boring stuff, but this is operating the plan as it's stated in the plan document or, or documents and policies that you've added over time. So when we are going through these changes today, what we want to do is bring them back and tie them to how they impact these various responsibilities that you have um, as it relates to the plan. So with that, we'll turn to kind of our first area, which is in the investments category. Um, one of the things that I consider to be the big area being talked about as it relates to your investment responsibility is as it relates to, um, there's several different names for this, right? But call it SRI, call it ESG, uh, whatever you prefer to call it, but socially responsible investing. Um, so you know, we've seen the DOL has been issuing guidance with respect to ESG for several years now. Um, and, and maybe I should just take a step back and, and take a moment to make sure we're all on the same page as it relates to terminology. So when I say ESG, that stands for environmental, social, and governance factors. Uh, when I'm talking about SRI, so again, these are all meaning the same thing, used interchangeably, pardon me, for the most part. Um, SRI is referring to socially responsible investments, or ETI, another term used by the department, of economically targeted investments. So all the same here, and I'll kind of use them um, as we talk through this 
um, discussion point, but what we've seen is that over time, there's been a variety of guidance. Um, I think we refer to it in our regulatory updates is a uh, ping pong, right? We've gone back and forth on what exactly the guidance is. The most recent guidance came in Field Assistance Bulletin 2018-01. And that's where we want to focus our attention today is you as a plan sponsor, plan fiduciary, what do you need to know as it relates to if you desire to have ESG funds in your investment lineup, what are the guardrails for that? Um, one thing I should say at the outset is that by talking to you about this topic, we are not implying that you must have this by any means. That's not the concept here. You don't have to have it. It's if this is something um, where you've taken a look at the needs of your plan and participants, and there is a participant need to have this, then once you determine there's a participant need for this, then once you've made it past that hurdle, that's where we would say, okay, here's kind of the guardrails. So what are the guardrails from this recent guidance? Uh, from, from our firm's perspective, it is, you know, the DOL believes it's, reasonable to include an ESG fund in your lineup of designated investment alternatives or in your fund lineup, assuming it's prudently managed because it's not crowding out other non-ESG options. So because you can have both ESG and non-ESG sitting side by side on that same lineup. But where we wanna kind of draw a line there is that it's probably not going to be considered reasonable to include ESG as that default option. And, and I think the reason, you know, if, if you take a step back and think about it, everyone has their own preferences as it relates to what they believe to have kind of their, their social biases, right? So if you're making it the default, that's not really gonna meet the needs of the participants. Going back to the baseline of what is the risk required, it's the needs of the participants that we're meeting. So we can't meet everyone's needs in a default setting, but if it's just another option setting beside other non-ESG options, then that's going to be um, workable from the Department of Labor's perspective, we believe. Um, I'll go ahead and kind of add some other food for thought for you. Um, we believe, and we're working with our plans on adding some language to the investment policy statement as it relates to how you would be monitoring um, these ESG options if you've made the decision to have them in your lineup. One other kind of quick thing to add here is that, um, so we did have the Field Assistance Bulletin that came out in April, and then after that, there was a GAO report, um, so Government Accountability Office report, that then had some additional findings, and you'll find those in our full regulatory update, but. Um, those kind of leave room for a call to action for additional guidance. So kind of our last bullet point there for guidance is to continue to follow along to see if there's now additional guidance that may eventually come um, after the fact now that we've had that GAO report. So I'll leave you with that as it relates to, um, with, your, with respect to your investment responsibility, I think the big thing for this year that's really changed is as it relates to um, ESG. So the next area I want to talk a little bit about is an area that I generally get fairly excited about, um, as some of my clients know, and this is the area of talking about litigation. So you know, one of the things you'll notice is I'm trying to kind of tie this back to your various areas of responsibility. And when we talk about litigation, I think one of the things you'll find is that these takeaways, they're really going to apply um, as it relates to the litigation discussion to your investment related responsibilities, your plan and vendor management responsibilities, but also your fiduciary governance responsibilities. So we'll find takeaways for all three here. So, um, you know, the litigation one is interesting. We're continuing to see additional cases filed, um, but the, the cases are really starting to shift, right? So um, in the past, we've seen that 
Um, when there were cases that were always filed against 401k plans, we saw, um, I wish this was a bit more interactive because I think I would know what you're saying, right? Um, what we saw was a lot of settlement, settlement, settlement. And those settlement numbers were typically pretty high. Um, when we saw the turn to the 403b cases, um, if we think all the way back to August of 2016, in August of 2016, we saw the start of the 403b cases. We've got kind of the graphic there to show um, a highlight of those 403b cases. But the 403b cases, things are starting to change. And I apologize because the graphic is uh, maybe a touch out of date because these cases are really changing every single day. Um, and, and I don't have a graphic person on staff who can, who can change this every single day for me. Um, so, you know, we have to kind of just talk through this, but one of the things that's uh, really different in these 403B cases is that there's not that same appetite to settle every case. And the glorious thing about that is that we're starting to get some real, I'll call it feedback from the courts because we're getting, um, we're getting case law from the courts. We're hearing what the courts are saying on some of these claims that traditionally one claim after another was made but then there was just a settlement. So we didn't get to see the courts really weigh in. So this is really exciting. Um, so briefly, let me just kind of do a recap for those who haven't been following along quite as closely of what some of the initial claims were in these 403B cases. Um, so with respect to the 403B cases, some of the initial claims were things that, they seem pretty specific to 403B cases, but I think what you'll see as we talk through this a lot of the takeaways can be applied both to 403B and to 401K cases. Um, so if you're a 401K plan, don't tune out because I think you'll see that there's a tie back to you as well. So some of the initial claims included things like too many record keepers resulting in higher fees, too many investment options resulting in participant confusion, revenue sharing that led to excessive fees and kickbacks, um, you know, utilization of some specific, some specific funds, um, utilization of actively managed rather than passively managed uh, with no actual benefit for doing so. Retail share classes with higher fees were utilized when institutional share classes were available and then lack of a competitive bidding process for your vendor. So those were, that, that's a summary, but in general, all of these cases have very similar claims. So, that kind of sets the stage. What we've seen now is that we've had um, at least four cases. We, we did have one settlement, um, and the one settlement um, in the Chicago case was for a very low settlement number from my perspective. Then we've also had one case that went to trial, and that was the NYU case. Um, you know, fully litigated, went the whole time, and so we have some really great takeaways from that case, which I'll share a bit in a moment. And then we've had three additional cases that were entirely dismissed and resulted in wins for the defendant plan sponsor. So, you know, for me, it's starting to really be a real change in the tides of showing that there is some success that we can see for plan sponsors. It's not just a win for the plaintiffs in every single case. And I think that's really fantastic. Um, some just really high level takeaways from you know, the NYU case particularly, but then I'll turn to the next slide, which kind of turns it back to you and some action items. Um, so you know, one, ERISA is all about a prudent process. One of the things we really saw in the NYU case is that the court was not focused on the outcome, but they were concerned about the process. And I'll talk a touch more about that on the next slide but we really started to see it's about the process, not the actual end result. The next key takeaway that I started to see was that you know, the documentation was so key um, because if you're sued and then you have to go to trial, you need to be able to show what the process was. If you don't have the documentation to show what the process was, it's virtually like the process never happened. So having the documentation to show that and again, I'll talk about that a bit more on the next slide particularly, but we've got to have the documentation to show that the process actually happened. The final piece, which I think was really, really key, um, and, and even though the court kind of still let it slide, um, they really noted and it, 
in somewhat of a scathing way that educating committee members is critically important. Um, you know, those serving on the committee need to understand the role and responsibilities, and they need to be asking questions along the way. Um, so I think that really helps us to kind of see, you know, what is it that you, and I know this seems like an, a very long list of action items, uh, so, you know, we won't go through each of these, but again, these cases are starting to show what are the things that you should be doing as um, a retirement plan fiduciary, and there's definitely some specific references and some of these opinions from the courts that make this very clear. So, you know, for example, the first one, the fiduciary training for committee members. Um, when you have those acting as a part of your committee, the NYU case definitely made clear that, and they called out in the opinion, they called out committee members who knew what they were doing and those who didn't know what they were doing. And because it was clear that there was at least one committee member who really, really knew what they were doing, that kind of saved the case. Um, but they did make clear that there were some who didn't know what they were doing, and, and the court definitely took issue with that. So one way to get around that, be able to demonstrate that you're providing training to committee members. Um, another thing that's critically important is to you know, meet regularly, and then of course have a way to show you met regularly. So document those meetings with meeting minutes. Um, that was definitely clear in the NYU case again. Uh, it's went through, um, you know, they went through a trial. They talk about it in the um, opinion from the court that there was evidence of the process. It shows that they were meeting quarterly. And I think that was pretty indicative of most of these um, that are having success and winning is that they had a process, they were meeting quarterly. Another one um, that I think is a key point is um, when the plan lacks expertise, ERISA does say you can hire and you should hire outside experts. Uh, so it, it, certainly ERISA doesn't expect and the Department of Labor doesn't expect that you individually have expertise for every single thing. But what it does expect is that where you lack expertise, you go hire the proper parties to help you fill those gaps. Um, the NYU case, it, I believe it was certainly saved by the fact that they did hire an outside consultant. And again, the court went back to that and said, hey, you had this one committee member who really knew what they were doing. You also had this outside investment consultant. And so that was a real part of the opinion is going through how that outside consultant was assisting with the monitoring of those investments. And I think that was really critical. With that, don't hang your hat on the fact that, oh, we've hired an outside consultant and now we're finished, right? Hands off, we're finished, we can just go back to our job. No, not the case. Um, once you hire that consultant, you have to monitor the consultant or um, any of your vendors, and we'll talk about that a bit more later. But once you hire the consultant, you've got to monitor them and I should, have, I should have bolded that last part to ask questions. Um, you know, in the NYU case, there was some case law cited, and it's, uh, I wanna read this quote because I think this one was really good. It said, in this regard, good old fashioned kicking the tires of the appointed fiduciary's work is required. Arissa's duty to investigate requires fiduciaries to review the data the consultant gathers to assess its significance and to supplement it where necessary. So I think that the, the kicking the tires thing I thought was just a good thing to keep in your mind. Um, make sure you're engaged. You know, if you show up at the committee meetings, um, you know, for example, Multnomah well, Group, we provide your investment report. We provide various reports throughout the quarter. Um, it's not enough to just show up and, and not ever ask a question or not be engaged. Certainly don't have to ask questions every meeting, but make sure you're engaged in the process. Make sure that you ask questions. Don't just take everything at face value. Um, some other ones, you know, don't want to spend too long belaboring these points, but um, formalize a process by which fees for investments and service providers are reviewed and benchmarked. Um, one thing I thought was interesting is that uh, an RFP is not always required. I think that's good to keep in mind that you know there's other ways to document that you're checking on fees. You don't have to just go out and do a formal RFP all the time. Um, you certainly want to be monitoring your investments. Um, always good to consider the non-proprietary investment options. And then kind of the final two I'll end on with this slide are just you know make sure you're implementing some sort of I call it a fiduciary calendar. Uh, we kind of call it a fiduciary program here at Walt Group. 
but some sort of you know task list or program to keep yourself on track to make sure that you know, as we're talking about all these three kind of broad categories of fiduciary responsibility and governance that you have something to keep you on track to make sure you're hitting all these areas because as you think about it there's a lot to do and accomplish and finally as we kind of end on this note um, document 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 um, there's probably such a thing as documenting too much but you want to make sure you're documenting the critical aspects to show that you followed your prudent process. So with that, you know, I think from the litigation, the main takeaway there is I've given you some action items for consideration, but keep in mind that the litigation gives us takeaways in all of our areas of responsibility. Um, what traditionally had been always just, from my perspective, a surefire win for the plaintiffs, that's not always the case. Now it's starting to shift a bit and I think if you have the proper procedures and safeguards in place, um, you are preparing yourself to be able to get a dismissal if you are ever sued. So I think that's a great, um, a great positive new thing that we're starting to see on uh, the plan sponsor side. With that, I'm gonna go ahead and shift our focus a bit. Um, and we're moving on to kind of the next category, um, which is really talking a little bit more about your responsibilities as it relates to vendor and plan management. Um, so this is some of the stuff that's maybe not quite as exciting to talk about, but certainly important to talk about, especially as you head into maybe some of your end of the year conversations with your service providers or those who are generating things like your plan documents for you. Um, so one of the things that we did talk about briefly at the beginning is the fact that there's been some congressional activity around um, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act and the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2018. We saw the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, you know, that was coming in right at the 11th hour at the end of last year. And then that was followed up, I think it was in February, that we saw the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2018. Um, and those, you know, those are pretty substantial tax measures. And then I don't want to say, you know, buried inside, but, you know, as kind of tag alongs to some of those things, there were provisions that really had some impacts as it relates to retirement plans. Um, these are little things, but little things that can have some pretty big impacts from an administrative aspect to your retirement plan. So I'll just go over some of the kind of high level things, but then the critical takeaway will be your action items as it relates to how you need to be working with those uh, service providers to make sure this gets implemented the right way as we head into 2019. So, you know, at a high level, the changes, um, you know, really, well, there's definitely some changes going on. I'm not gonna go into the ones on things like disaster relief. I think um, if you do wanna take a look at the handout that I mentioned that'll be coming out after the webinar, that's gonna go in much, much more detail as to what all the specific changes are. Um, also, I think we did another handout earlier this year that has a lot greater detail as well. Happy to always provide that to you. Feel free to just shoot us an email and we can get that out to you. At a high level though, um, you know, changes with respect to loans. So um, the new rules do extend the time period for qualified plan loan offsets. And this applies, um, you know, if you're thinking about where this has come up, it applies when there's a default on a loan and, and that's gonna be in the situation likely, you know, termination from employment, that's where this is gonna come up. So, you know, question one is, do you even have loans in your plan? If you have no loans in your plan, you can tune out for a second. Um, the second thing would be, do you have hardships? Um, if you have no hardships, again, tune out for the slide. Um, because this isn't going to apply to you for a moment. But one of the other changes is, you know, sources for hardship withdrawals, that's changed. So now there's going to be more funds that can be available for hardships that under the regulations were not available previously. Um, the next thing is that for hardships, and you know, this one seems to be one that's tripped people up quite a bit, but for hardships, it was always a six month period um, when someone took a hardship in which they were not allowed to continue contributing to the plan. That rule has changed as well so that that six months is not a required um, suspension of the hardships. 
Um, so those are kind of, again, this is super high level, not an exhaustive list of the change, uh, changes that were made, but I just wanted to give you kind of a brief snapshot. Um, if you think any of these do apply, we want to make sure that then you kind of start to consider what these action items would be. So what should you be doing? Um, you know, first and foremost, consider do the terms of the plan align with the plan's practices and that of the service providers for the plan? So I think there's always a two-part approach to this, right? So one is what you're doing lining up with your document, and then two, does that line up with what your vendor's doing? So I think that's kind of question one, and it's does that line up today? Then question two, you know, what are the plan's service providers offering as it relates to these items, so loans and hardships. So for example, uh, seems pretty straightforward, but are you getting administration of loans through your vendor or not? Are you getting administration of hardships through your vendor or not? Um, typically, as you start to go up market, that's probably gonna be something that the vendor's doing for you. Maybe in more of a smaller plan market, the vendor may not be doing that, but it absolutely varies dependent upon the vendor you're working with. And so you absolutely need to make sure that you know what your contract says with that vendor and that you're on the same page with the vendor as to what's being provided for you. So absolutely an action item you wanna be thinking about. Um, there was some guidance, I think at the end of 2017, I believe, where um, there were some changes to the manual for the IRS that said, you know, it made some changes about the documentation that needed to be available to substantiate a hardship. Do you think that's always a good thing to be circling back with the vendor to check to see, are they doing that? Should you be doing that? How is that working? And is that available upon audit later? The last action item is just, you know, checking with your document service provider and or your record keeper, for example, and making sure, you know, what's their plan for if any of these changes with respect to loanship, that's, pardon me, loans and hardships, if any of these changes are going to impact your plan, how is that going to get implemented and rolled out? So um, if you have, if you're using a plan document from your record keeper, it's probably gonna be a lot easier to kind of get this all transitioned. If you have a, an attorney drafted document, maybe you need to have a conversation both with your attorney and then subsequently with the vendor uh, pardon me, or record keeper to make sure that everyone is coordinated as we head into 2019. And I would say now is the time to definitely be having those conversations. So as it relates to both vendor and plan management, I think this is where you need to be focusing um, as you think about what happened with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act and the Bipartisan Budget Act. The next one we'll briefly talk about is, is quite timely for us. Uh, I feel like I, I considered it to be a bit of breaking news. Um, it is not mentioned in the handout regulatory update. Um, and, and frankly, hopefully this does not apply to any of you on the phone. But the issue is that you know plan errors do arise. Um, and, and when they do, we just need to make sure we have the appropriate uh, processes in place to deal with them. So, you know. Quick kind of just reminders that we want to think about um, when plan problems come up and we need to do some sort of filing with the IRS for that. How, how do we do that and what is that? So that's when we return to EPCRS, so the Employee Plans Compliance Resolution System. And there's three ways that you can go about um, finding a resolution through EPCRS. So the first is self-correction. And um, that doesn't require an actual filing, you're doing that yourself. Um, the second would be VCP, or the Voluntary Correction Program. And then the third would be, um, you know, once you're under audit, you can do the Audit Cap Program, um, or the Audit Closing Agreement Program. So we, we did have, um, I believe it was late last week, right, that we had um, a change to, um, and really a great change from my perspective um, as the IRS kind of steps into the, the future and um, they came out with their revenue procedure 2018-52 
So that was released on September 28th, and that replaces uh, Revenue Procedure 2016-51. Uh, I, I won't go through, I think it was a you know, fairly lengthy um, issuance, but the gist of it from my perspective, I haven't read all um, you know, 100 plus pages of it yet, but I think the gist of it is really that they're moving to electronic filing. It's out with the paper, it's in with the electronic filing. Um, the gist is that that's going to start as of January 1st, 2019. I think they give you a brief window, and that brief window from Jan 1 to March 31st says you could do it via electronic filing or paper, but anything starting April 1st of 19, it's all going to be electronic. If you try to send it via paper after that time, then too bad they're going to send it back. So I think, you know, it's a great step. And honestly, from my perspective, if you kind of look the way the industry is moving, um, you saw in President Trump's executive order that he was really moving toward um, administrative efficiency and was starting to suggest electronic disclosures. So for some of you who um, you know, are dealing with those pain points like your participant fee disclosures under 40485, um, oftentimes a headache, um, things like that, they're starting to make it more that electronic file uh, disclosures would be the default and then paper would be that you know last resort option as opposed to right now where it's like paper is the default and then if you want to go electronic you've got a bunch of hurdles to go through so um you know the only official word on moving electronic is right now from uh, this revenue procedure but hopefully others will follow as a result of things like the executive order that came out um, not too long ago the good news there, um, but hopefully no one on the call will ever have to use that uh, in the event you do though, please put that in your toolkit for further notice. The next one we'll hit on just briefly, um, I mentioned it at the beginning, but still thinking in terms of our vendor management approach, right? So a lot of today is talking about vendor and plan management, um, as that's a big focus of the things that are changing and how it impacts your day-to-day -day work with your retirement plan. Um, but this one is as it relates to the Department of Labor fiduciary rule. For those who wanna take a really deep dive, I think we have several, several webinars and, and materials on this uh, topic. Today will kind of just suffice it to say that we did have the Department of Labor fiduciary rule long, long ago. The real goal of that rule was to provide greater protection for consumers. Um, ultimately, it um, has been unwound and then vacated in the Fifth Circuit. So the Department of Labor fiduciary rule is no more. Um, as I mentioned, you know, a bit ago, that's that's really the theme of you know pulling back regulation. The way it ended up being, um, it, I'll say, taken out of commission was that um, the DOL lacked authority to um, put this rule into place. And so now that it's been taken out of place and no longer applies to your retirement plan um, or any of the financial professionals who are working with your retirement plan, in its place, we've had the Securities and Exchange Commission come in and they actually do likely have authority, which was given to them under Dodd-Frank, um, you know, quite a few years ago now. So the SEC has proposed a rule this rule is, again, it's related to um, governing financial professionals and their conduct as it relates to um, investors and then you know, somewhat the retirement plan. But, um, it's interesting in that there are some things that are very similar to the Department of Labor fiduciary rule. There's also some that are very different, uh, some components that are very different. So at this point, the SEC's rule is only a proposed rule. It has um, not come out as a final rule yet, though they have collected several comments. Um, so, you know, why do you care about this at all? What's the action item for you as it relates to a retirement plan? Um, it, it matters for you because as part of good vendor management, you should know what standard applies to the financial professional that's working with your plan and with your participants. Uh, so, you know, what are your real action items? You should review updated contracts and 4082 disclosures that may be coming as a result of the pullback on the fiduciary rule. Um, and then of course, continue to monitor what happens with the SEC rule in the event that that changes anything in the future. 
you should review materials that are provided to your participants. Um, I think it's best practice that you should always be doing that, but it kind of became more important under the fiduciary rule to again continue to do that. Uh, the other thing you should do is really consider whether service providers may be utilizing participant data and information for cross-selling additional services. So again, that's kind of going to what role is the financial professional who has access to your participants, what role are they playing, and how are you monitoring that given that you're giving that service provider access to your participants. Um, you know, so, and, and we can do a whole other webinar on that, uh, but I think that's a good action item to just really consider for today. Finally, just, you know, continue to monitor these rule changes uh, because I think they will continue to change over time. I don't think we're at a set um, standpoint right now with what the final rules are. So with that, um, we'll move on from the fiduciary rule. There's one other kind of exciting topic I would like to cover, and then we will finish it out and save a few moments for questions. So what we've been talking about today is a lot as it relates to things that you have to do or are required to do in terms of what your fiduciary responsibilities are. So for example, you have a fiduciary responsibility to select and monitor investments and you have to do that in a prudent fashion. You have this responsibility with respect to selection and monitoring of service providers, so you have to do that in a prudent fashion. You know, there's also these opportunities to encourage savings that are not required under ERISA, not required at all, but they're certainly oftentimes provided. Um, and, and I think sometimes they're provided, you know, for, for a lot of various reasons, but you know, mostly it's the culture of the company or institution, uh, the culture of the university. It's the right thing to do for the employees. We want to offer these additional benefits. We want to help people save more so that they can retire with dignity. They want to have a great retirement. Um, and they want to be set up for that from an institution that um, you know, they're proud to have worked at for several years. I think you know, that's kind of part of the mentality of why these additional benefits may be offered. So some examples of a few of those things, you know, for example, employee education one-on-one -on -one participant advice. Uh, the new kind of, uh, within the last two years, we've seen a lot of these student loan reimbursement programs. Um, there's these budget assistance programs that I've started to see. Um, recently, I was talking to a vendor who has a cyber theft tool that's come up. Um, I've also seen another vendor that has something they've rolled out um, with respect to, I think it's like wills and trusts that they can help with. Um, so these are all things that Again, they're not required under ERISA. Um, you don't have to have them. But I think that what you have to keep in mind is that, you know, even though these are not part of your fiduciary responsibilities to offer these enhanced employee benefits to employees, once you do, if you're tying them to the retirement plan, and if the record keeper is being paid for these out of plan assets, so maybe they're just, quote, a throw-in, but if it's the same record keeper who's doing these services that might be already paid out of plan assets, then you need to be monitoring them from my perspective. And you need to be monitoring them with the same prudent process that you would your vendor otherwise. Um, in addition, you know, arguably, even if you're just giving the vendor participant data or access to these, um, the, if you give the participant data to the vendor so that the vendor can provide these services even if there's no payment from plan assets maybe the corporate assets are used to pay the vendor entirely even just the notion that because the participant was made available to the vendor for these services maybe there's an argument there could be cross-selling there um, it's a very gray area so i would argue that it's a best practice to use a prudent process for selection and monitoring of these uh, so just some kind of food and thought, food for thought, pardon me, as you start to think about what creative ways you can start to add to kind of your tool set for these enhanced employee benefits. I think it's fabulous to have these additional employee benefits. I think they're really going to help people be able to save for retirement, but we want to make sure we're doing them the right way. 
Another thing to keep in mind is that um, in the past, uh, eh, I'd say in the past year or so, there's been some really great developments with some of these. Two that I would point out to you, I won't go into detail today, you mentioned in the, the longer um, handout, and then we've got some other materials on the website about them. But both with respect to health savings accounts, as well as the student loan reimbursement programs, I, I think there's some nice things, um, you know, I think many people are familiar with the student loan reimbursement programs and the private letter ruling that came out recently. Uh, keep in mind that private letter ruling only applies to the one organization for which it was issued. But I think that we'll see maybe some further guidance eventually come from that. Uh, so stay tuned. I think that those, you know, HSAs and student loans are two things that are really on the horizon and we'll continue to see additional things coming forth there. So finally, as we kind of start to close it up with some questions, just wanted to circle back to really, you know, how does this apply to you? What are the specific action items in these three areas that apply to you as you go out today and start to take action or put together your to-do list of what you've learned from this webinar? So the first area that we really talked about was investment monitoring. What are the things that you could be doing today as it relates to investment monitoring, that first area of responsibility for you? Um, I would say, you know, one, review your IPS and investment menu related to ESG. Um, if that's something that totally doesn't apply to the needs of your participants, disregard. But if you have a participant need there, make sure you're checking that out. Um, document the investment monitoring review. That is critically important as a result of those 403B cases. And that's not specific to 403B. It absolutely applies on the 401k side as well. Hire outside experts where necessary. Again, certainly coming out of those cases and what we're seeing from the courts in those cases. It's okay if you don't know how to do it, but make sure you hire someone to help where you can't do it. And once you hire those experts, get engaged with them, ask them questions. I particularly like when someone asks a question. I know they're not sleeping during the meeting and it makes me feel better. Uh, next, kind of in the fiduciary governance sphere, um, meet regularly and document the process. Meeting minutes, meeting minutes, meeting minutes, but also just you know maintaining the reports from the meetings I think are great as well. Anything that shows the documentation process. Fiduciary training for committee members I think is a fantastic idea. It doesn't have to be long. It doesn't mean you have to have you know a two-hour training. You can do it a variety of ways. I've seen um, some attorneys do a great job of they'll come in once a year and do like an hour and a half training. I think that's a great idea. They might do an hour training, um, something like that. Um, I've seen it done other ways. One of the things that we try to do with some of our committees is, you know, maybe we do 15 minutes of meeting, whatever the time allotment we can get for that meeting, but just chunking it up too. So just some sort of ongoing training to make sure the committee can stay up to date on best practices. You share a calendar. I think it's a great idea, as I mentioned earlier, to have some sort of calendar to track who's doing what. Is it the vendor responsible? Is it a uh, consultant? Is it someone in HR, someone in finance? Make sure we know what's due, who's doing it, and when. And then lastly, you know, vendor and plan management. Wanting to make sure if you have loans, you have hardships, make sure that you're taking a look at that as we head into the new year, given the changes. We also want to take uh, note of the new process for plan corrections. Hopefully you don't need that, but in the event you do. And then finally, uh, you know, monitor vendor services and fees. I think we say that, you know, frequently when we're talking to clients, but that's always critical. And last but not least, just, you know, communicating with service providers. So be it your auditor, your attorney, your investment consultant, your record keeper, communication is key and will you know, keep it to a great process for everyone. Uh, so with that being said, I think we will open it up for questions. Uh, we're really almost to the top of the hour here. So I appreciate everyone tuning in today. I know that's a lot of information. We look forward to any questions you might have now or likewise, um, any questions that you may have, uh, feel free to shoot um, any of the consultants here or myself an email. We're happy to tackle those with you or dig in on any of the technical aspects of any of the changes that we've covered today. And I think as well, if I didn't mention it well enough earlier, feel free to use the question and answer pane. 
um, so that I think you can type it in via that pane and then it'll share that. And we have one question coming in here. One great question that came in is just, um, you know, what is the best way to get fiduciary training for someone who has a difficult time understanding these topics? So I think one of the questions that's being raised is a fantastic question, which is making sure that the training can be tailored to various um, various levels of understanding uh, within the committee or within the organization. So I think one of the great things about putting together a committee is that you can have committees that have different areas of expertise, right, which is the best committee from my perspective. So you want to have people who maybe represent different areas of, um, if it's a college, for example, different areas of the college, or you want to have people with different areas of expertise. A few people who are um, representing the investment, a few people representing HR, a few people who might have some procurement knowledge, so they might be better at things like collection and monitoring and vendors. So you want to bring together all these different areas, but at the same time, then we need to train and get people up to speed on all of the areas. So I think that's a great point, is how do you train these different levels? Um, I think the point to be made is that we have to have a multi-level training approach and maybe break out different training sessions for different groups. So perhaps um, one approach could be if committee members are willing to do it is to do some training outside of the committee meetings. So that could be a big ask of uh, committee members. But if you've got committee members who are willing, perhaps you could do 20 minutes or 30 minutes before or after committee meetings and do it on various topics for which perhaps if committee members aren't as proficient in investments, Maybe you have them do a training on investments 30 minutes before the meeting. And then at the next meeting, 30 minutes before, you may do a training on something like um, selection of service providers. Maybe the next one is 30 minutes before on operations. And people can come at their option to make sure they're learning about areas where they might not have as much proficiency. So I think that's a great question, and perhaps um, my strategy suggested could work for addressing different levels of proficiencies in different areas. It looks like it looks like one of the other questions that's coming in is related to just on the litigation front. Um, give me a second while I read the question. So one of the questions coming in is just on the litigation front. You know, where do we anticipate the litigation going? Um, you know, do we anticipate that more 403B cases will be filed? Um, with respect to where do we see the litigation going, obviously this is, um, this is my opinion, not necessarily maybe the opinion of the firm. Um, but from my perspective, I think one of the things that has been interesting, I think we even had a slide on a few other webinars we've done about the fact that there was a big uptick in litigation, um, kind of the early to mid-2000s. Then there was a lull for a while, and then since about 2013, it just continually picked up and gone up, up, up. What will be interesting to see is now that we've seen um, success with some of these uh, plan sponsors who are fighting back and actually having some success winning some of these cases, um, it'll, from my perspective, be interesting to see where it goes next. I don't think it's necessarily going to be that all the cases just suddenly stop getting filed because four plan sponsors have won in some of these four or three B cases. Um, I think that there's always a new angle or target for which plaintiffs firms can go after, but I do think that it could be interesting to see as some of these plan sponsors have won and now they're starting to get appealed. So for example, the NYU case, that's being appealed. Um, some of these other cases um, where there has been success, they are now up on appeal. So in uh, the Northwestern case and the University of Pennsylvania case, they're up on appeal. So as we start to see some of them getting appealed, it will be interesting to see how that plays out. 
if there is success at the appellate level, um, that I think could really have, that, that could be very indicative of what's going to happen next based on the current theories that are being used in some of these cases. Um, because it's definitely clear that if, you're, if you've got a proven process, you've got the documentation to show it, the court seems to be shutting it down in some of these cases, but we'll see what we have, have happen on appeal. So that's a great question. And it looks like, I'm happy to stay on if there's other questions, but it looks like I think we've tackled the questions that have come in. If there's any other questions, uh, I'll stay on for a minute longer. Um, otherwise, we really appreciate everyone taking the time to join today. Um, thank you so much. And um, feel free to shoot an email with any further questions. Otherwise, we will end the webinar.